Um, I've been asked to introduce myself and then briefly, um, briefly myself and then the other speakers. Um, I'm John Cottingham. I'm Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Reading, where I worked many years and since retirement have been at Heathrop College, London, University of London, now sadly closed, and currently a Professor of Philosophy of Religion at Roehampton University also in London. Um, I worked mainly on 17th century philosophy for most of my career, but more recently on the philosophy of religion, um, including a book called The Spiritual Dimension and one called Philosophy of Religion Towards a More Humane Approach. But now to get to our main panelists, uh, starting from farthest away from me, though only, only in terms of spatial matters, not uh, philosophically necessarily, uh, is Douglas Headley, who is Professor of Philosophy of Religion at, uh, here at Cambridge, the Cambridge Faculty of Divinity, and he's currently Principal Investigator uh, for uh, a project um, funded by the Arts and, um, and Humanities Research Council on Cambridge Platonism, um, and we've heard something about that in some of, to, some of the papers for this um, colloquium. And he specializes, as well as in Neoplatonism, uh, in the notion of the imagination, and probably best known for his trilogy on the imagination, um, which includes the iconic imagination, 2016, uh, and then there's Sacrifice Imagined, Violence, Atonement and the Sacred, uh, Living Forms of the Imagination, and a book uh, focusing on Coleridge, Aids to Reflection and the Mirror of the Spirit. Uh, then Simon May, um, in the middle of the trinity of speakers, um, is um, visiting professor at King's College London, and um, his books include Love, A New Understanding of an Ancient Emotion, which has just come out this year, um, published by uh, Oxford University Press. And this is a follow-up to a book that um, has influenced many of us called Love, A History, published by Yale University Press in 2011. Um, He's also written on a wide variety of other topics, including Nietzsche's ethics and uh, a collection of his own aphorisms called Thinking Aloud. And then nearest to me is Roger Scruton, University of Buckingham. So Roger Scruton is a writer and philosopher who's published over 40 books uh, in philosophy, in aesthetics and politics, and is widely translated. He's a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and teaches both in England and America and is a senior fellow at the, Royal, uh, at the um, Ethics and Publish Public Policy Center in Washington, DC. So um, let us begin. Um, I've been helpfully given a list of um, possible topics for our speakers which have the virtue that they implicitly pick out one of, a, one of the three. So I'll, I'll start by giving each of the three speakers a chance to, to speak, a, not at length, but in an unrestricted way about uh, the particular topics that interest them. And then um, there'll be opportunity for the panelists to respond to each other. Um, and then I may raise some questions before opening it to the floor. So I hope that sounds a reasonable pattern. So this is, I think, mainly directed towards Simon. Um, why is love connected to our need for roots? So, 
in my own thinking, I went through the, I surveyed the history of the ways people have understood love, and I came to the conclusion that there were about six distinct ways of conceiving love. One was that love was a response to the beauty we see in an object or in a person. Another was that love was a response to the virtues of character that we see. So we love those who have virtues of character of a certain kind that are similar to our own. Another was that love is grounded in sexual desire, in a desire for sexual uh, uh, intimacy with another person, and so on. And uh, I came to, well, I then came to ask myself, almost in a sort of private dialogue with myself, I, I said, well, you know, when you love a person, or when you love a piece of music, or when you love a landscape, um, or when you love God, which I've done on and off quite intensely in my life, I asked myself, you know, what is it that actually you're feeling? I mean, what is it that really, uh, that, that, that this love is grounded in? And I, and I came to the conclusion, and others might agree or they might disagree, that it's essentially the idea that the loved one was grounding me in a world that I supremely valued. Um, and that that was what, that that was a thing about them. So I might see several people who are very beautiful with whom I might wish to be very intimate and indeed to spend a great deal of time, but only one of them gave me this feeling of deep love. And I just through, so to speak, introspection came to that view. And I then thought, well, you know, uh, I shouldn't be too solipsistic about this. I should go out and see if this, um, if this account of my own experience is replicated out there in, in, any, in anyone else's. And the first place to go are, it seemed to me, to be you know, the great mythical stories that have, are the foundation of our Western consciousness. And I, you know, going through the Bible, through Homer, and so on, I, I came to see such well-known myths as Odysseus's return to Ithaca, as Abraham's call to Canaan, uh, even Proust, you know, the, when, when Marcel sees the gaggle of girls on the beach and there's one in whom he says he sees this new life, he sees this, new po this whole new, a new possibility, new possibilities for being, um, a whole new world opens to him. They're all beautiful, the girls on the beach. They're all charming. In fact, at first he says, you know, I don't know which one I would alight on. But then he sees in Albertine this, and he describes it as a new world that opens. And I could give you many examples from myth and from literature, but I won't take your time, too much time in doing that, which it seems to me express this idea that in those we love, we find this world that suddenly we realize is the world we want to live in, somehow promised. And this idea of promise sets up this rich intentional structure of love, because it's always a movement into the future, um, into some future consummation. And of course, it's something that depends crucially then on relationship and developing the richness of relationship that will make it possible to bring this about. And it's not just about meeting a great need like that. I think when we have a sense that such a promise is offered to us, it unleashes from us the greatest self-giving of which human beings are capable, potentially culminating in self-sacrifice. That's how great the need <clears throat> is. And I've mentioned a few examples, and with this next one I'll stop. To me, the ultimate example of a loved one that grounds us in the world that we supremely value is, and this is the tradition I come from, so perhaps it's the one that most naturally comes to me, is the monotheistic God. So God promises, God is after all conceived as the source of our being, and the source of our being to which we yearn to return. I mean, that the yearning to return to God is something expressed in innumerable texts. You know, mystics, for example, speak of it all the time. Augustine does. Many, 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 many people do. So God, for me, is the ultimate... You don't even have to believe in God to see the point, that, that God is the ultimate source and form and promise of home in a world that clearly is to be supremely valued. 
So that's, in a summary, my connection between love and roots. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Simon. We'll come back to that, uh, I'm sure, in the discussion. Um, the second question that's been suggested um, is one that I think is particularly directed towards some of Roger's work, which is the question, what role does or should death play in the way we think about love? Mm. Well, this is obviously something which I have thought about. I, I, I don't want to <clears throat> advance a metaphysical thesis quite as, a, as um, ambitious as Simon's, but I would say that there is a non-accidental connection between uh, love and death. And maybe it's true to say, as I do say in my book on Tristan and Isolde, that love of the erotic kind is a, is a relation between dying things. And as I say, it's only that which dies that can, can feel this emotion in the way that, uh, that we understand it. Uh, <clears throat> and um, this has to do with the fact that, that love, love of this kind, at least, is a form of cherishing. You want to care for the other. You're, uh, you're alarmed by the other's vulnerability. Uh, and at attitudes of protectiveness, uh, possessiveness, uh, of closeness, of, of clinging, these are not an accidental part of the love. They are really what the love consists in. And it's only because uh, the other is mortal and vulnerable that these uh, attitudes make sense. And, and I think uh, in the extreme forms of erotic passion, uh, the um, death isn't just a precondition, but it becomes or, or threatens to become the actual object of the passion. That's what Tristan and Isolde is all about. Uh, the, this su supreme fixation on the other and as the vulnerable recipient of your care um, gradually becomes wound together with the thought of her death uh, uh, and of death itself as the consummation. This is the thing uh, towards which your everything is tending, the thing which will actually release the object of your care from all the, the, the anxiety which uh, has preceded it. I th maybe that's a a, a, romantic, a, a specific romantic conception of love that's involved in, in that drama. But on the other hand, I don't think you can, in all the other forms of love, uh, simply put the idea of death aside either. You know, it's, it, it's the vulnerability of your child which, which principally sparks off in you that the extremes of tenderness, the desire to, uh, to stand between that child and the fate that would otherwise await it. And, and maybe uh, you know, this creates a, a theological problem. Uh, can the angels love each other as we do? You know, these immortal beings which don't uh, fear any, any harm, which, which undergo no risks. In the, in the Greek... Uh, theology. The gods have human relations, quasi-human relations to each other. They're supposed to love each other and um, be resentful towards each other and all the rest. We see it all happening in, in the Iliad. But actually, it never makes sense. Even Zeus and Hera, you know, the, the famous um, married couple, the only bits that you really are convinced by are the quarrels. Uh, and the, the, the idea that there is a love between these immortals uh, is a, a kind of a fantasy. It's, uh, you feel there's a kind of a, an insuperable coldness in their relation which comes from the fact that they can't really harm each other or, or protect each other from harm. So uh, I would like to say that at some stage we, we have to recognize that our mortality is built into our conception of love and love is partly what... Uh, one of our recourse, recourses in the face of mortality. Right, so what a very different and, as you say, perhaps romantically inspired conception mm. 
um, to contrast with Simon's more um, religious and metaphysical mm. grounded one. But the, before we come on to that, let's um, go to Douglas Headley, our third speaker. Um, and um, the question that's been suggested here is, how can love be understood as a form of play? Well, perhaps if I could start by referring to the German playwright and poet and philosopher Schiller in his letters on aesthetic education, where he enigmatically says that man only plays when properly human, and we're only human properly when we play. Now, behind that utterance is clearly a thought about um, what the Germans call Bildung, um, which is a beautiful word that we don't possess in English. Um, for education, I think, is much more limited. And the reason being that this, this word Bildung has a sense of formation, of cultivation, of, cultivation, of the, the shaping of the personality. And Schiller felt very strongly that the appreciation of beauty uh, is a very important part of this cultivation uh, of the human being. Uh, and we've had much discussion about the link between the notion of beauty and love. But my main reason for starting off with the conception of play in Schiller is because I think that Heusinger was right in his wonderfully named book, Homo Ludens, Man the Player, um, to claim that the real opposition between here is not between play and seriousness. There are lots of serious forms of play, and you only have to look at children to see how seriously they play. But between play and work, and work in an instrumental sense, i.e. work for a particular end or purpose, because perhaps there's a pointlessness in play that it shares with love at its highest level. So here I'm thinking of uh, the great German mystic, Meister Eckhart, where he frequently refers to the true nature of the divine in his middle high German as ane warumbe, as being ohne warum or without a why. The love of God is, in a sense, pointless. It's non-instrumental. It just is what it is. It emerges out of the divine plenitude. And perhaps love in the human context, if it is properly love, has a reflection, an image of this pointlessness of true love, but a pointlessness which is coming out of plenitude rather than need. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are so many questions raised by each of yes. those, but maybe I can go back in reverse order before we open it out to the floor. Um, so starting with Douglas, the pointlessness, I mean, I, I suppose the initial, perhaps naive question that occurred to me is, does this rob love of, of the ethical dimension, the sense that love is closely connected with value and valuing, rather than um, notions like play, which could be enjoyable, but aren't, aren't thought of as necessarily connected with finding oneself in, in a moral or ethical sense. Well, obviously, I think we have to be careful about the um, various meanings of play. And, mm. of course, there are some meanings here that are not helpful at all in this context. Um, and that's why I started off by mentioning Schiller. Um, <clears throat> but it seems to me that our culture is still very much dominated by utilitarianism and by an essentially economic view of life. Mm -hmm. 
And what this very rich tradition of play, which, by the way, is not confined to the West, but in many ways it's even more deeply grounded in the East, in, in the, the Hindu tradition in particular. I recently went to the holy festival in Mathura, which is, uh, Mathura is the holy city of, of uh, Lord Krishna, and the uh, um, carnival-like activity on the day of the festival, uh, throwing water and paint and being generally anarchic, is meant to be an image, a reflection of the spontaneous joy in the divine. And I think in our highly utilitarian, uh, goal-orientated, aims and objective, transferable skills culture, uh, the stress on this dimension of life and essential component of love, which is of a non-instrumental, non-utilitarian nature, I think is, is very significant. Yeah. Certainly, when one sees some uh, philosophy departments under the cosh of the government-sponsored research uh, assessment exercise, one wonders if spontaneity and joy in work has <laughs> gone out of the window altogether. Mm. Um, so, just moving to, to Roger, um, I, I thought it, it's interesting that you il illustrated the point about mortality and its connection with love by referring to the case of angels and what it would be like to them. Mm. But actually, of course, as you know, some of our uh, progressive friends, one thinks immediately of California, I don't know why, uh, hope that we will soon be immortal. Mm. Or at any rate, that we will live for um, a couple of hundred years, for starters. Mm. And people investing a lot of money in this and working actively towards it. Uh, would, you, would your view predict that this would lead to a diminution of erotic and other forms of passionate love? Well, certainly. I would have thought that the little bit of um, imaginative evidence that we have for this from Aldous Huxley and others mm. seems to suggest that, uh, that um, these, at least this kind of immortality, which is just a, a prolongation of our earthly existence, leads to a, 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 a loveless form of society because there, there is no need anymore for, for each other and it, there is each, each person becomes steadily eroded as a person to become a consumable thing you know and, uh, right. something that we can take pleasure in and uh, Huxley does it, it describes this brilliantly in brave, brave new, new world, world. Yeah. And I, don't, uh, I have I can't understand how people can actually want to do all this once they've read that book. I mean, it's a testimony, of course, to the, to the literary uh, um, uh, decline of our culture that they probably haven't read this book. And, um, but, I mean, if, if illiteracy was the only thing wrong with California, the world would be a lot better than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Are, are we allowed to intervene? Yes, vis -vis of course, yes, on? yes, of course. Because I would just, just like to say to Roger, I mean, I'm not sure that I would agree that to get rid of immortality would in some sense pull the rug from under love as such. I mean, certainly in a society that's, you know, deeply utilitarian and where it's all about, you know, preserving the body as healthy for as long as possible and so on, I can imagine that in that kind of spirit there would be no room for love. But the need, the, all the needs, for example, you know, the particular reasons that I've uh, summarized before, why people historically have thought you know, love is needed, all those would remain. I mean, mm. over, we would, still, uh, we would still wish to find beauty, we would still wish to find virtue. In my view, we would still wish to need to be ontologically grounded in the world in which we find ourselves. We would still be erotically attracted to others. So I don't think immortality and... Um, if I can just, that's one point. And another point on, on death, um, which I think you're absolutely right, it's absolutely bound up with love, and for perhaps even several other reasons. I mean, one is, the most obvious one, is that anything that we deeply want, uh, and we, which we do in a great love, uh, in the thought of loss immediately comes into our mm. feelings. We cannot help 
because we live in a world that's contingent and subject to loss, the ultimate loss being death, we cannot help thinking of death as present, um, not in a depressive sense, but as, in, as inevitably present. And secondly, we live in a culture that uh, is, you know, as, as Whitehead said, a, a sort of footnote to Plato. And Plato does give us the idea that we just find impossible, I think, to get rid of. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want to get rid of it, but many people do, which is the idea that love ultimately aims for the absolute, for the unchanging absolute perfection of beauty and goodness that is beyond the world of space and time, beyond the world of individuals. And that is a, an absolute world that can only be accessed, even in imagination, via the thought of death, because it's the death of our existence in space and time and individuality. Uh, only that makes possible the attainment of that ultimate object of love. So in that sense, I think in our culture, and all the cultures that are inheritors of, of Plato, uh, the relation between love and death is absolutely mm. intimate. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very hard to escape from. Right. So those are just two other thoughts on love and death. Well, I, I, yes. I, I, I'm not entirely um, persuaded um, by what you've just said, um, although it's obviously full of important observations. Uh, if we were to look at, at the, uh, the history, the individual history of love, where does it all begin? Obviously, um, there is that moment of vulnerability, the, the birth of the individual into this world, where you cling to the thing that gives you nurture and support and protection. And that primordial experience of being protected is one that haunts you through your life thereafter. You're always wanting to recover it. Uh, and indeed, if I were to be psychoanalytical about your idea of the ground of being, I would say that's what it is. That's ultimately where we're, where we're all going. I did want to say I blame my mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be too obvious. But, um, yeah. Yes, but, uh, you know... Uh, Fundamental to that relationship is the sense of the um, complete vulnerability of the child. And growing up, for the, for the child, growing up is coming to see that the mother that provides everything is just as vulnerable as you. And so you have to give back in some way. And then, of course, in old age, she is... Uh, the whole situation is reversed, and but I that, think that but that was precisely my first point about loss. Right. Oh, well, then that's jolly good. We agree. Um, <laughs> so we can shut up. <laughs> no, 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 that was what I was no, yeah, fine. I yes, loss no, right. Well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if I may interject yeah. here about in, in relation to to play, um, it's there's a very interesting book by Robert Bella called uh, Religion and Human Evolution, and one of the points that Bella makes is that play links us in, in very interesting ways to other mammals. And one of the distinctive aspects of play here is that it requires security. Uh, you can't play without having a relatively safe environment. So... Um, I, I think that that also has, um, again, a, a psychological implication here, that those that don't have the security to, in their very early phases are often very troubled adults. So um, there's a lot of child psychology literature here about the significance of play for the development of the robust and um, strong individual, mature, mm -hmm. adult psyche. Yeah. Good, thank you. I mean, since we, we're moving a bit towards the psychological aspects of these matters, perhaps I can just bring this back to Simon for the question for him uh, about what he's just, what he said in his presentation. I mean, it, it seemed to me that you gave a very concise and eloquent presentation of uh, which, which you which you do in your books of course um, 
of the existential yearning of the human soul for, for completion, which clearly is part a powerful aspect of what it is to be human. But one might ask, so how does that actually connect with love, the ordinary, or well not ordinary, but with human love between two people? Is it that love between two people is a sort of sublimated form of, or an easy way of trying to get over this more deep religious question of where we're supposed to be, where we're heading in relation to our maker, our creator, or how we are to achieve the selves that we are meant to be, or is there a is there a very close connection between that sort of religious drive and and the drive that two people that draws two people together? I think I mean I think there is a very close connection. Mm. Um, the the drive that draws two people together. Uh, I mean. The drive that causes you to, you know, having encountered three or four extremely beautiful people, say, or extremely virtuous people, to choose one of them, I think does have something to do with the promise that, you know, that Marcel felt on the beach when he saw that girl. Whether he turned out to be right or wrong is another point. But just that he saw in that girl a world that he wanted to become part of with her. And the idea was, you know, this is the world in which I will make my life. And perhaps if you believe in concepts like authenticity, which is mm -hmm. a very modern concept, just really dating since Rousseau, since the 18th century, uh, you know, I will discover in that, in discovering my own world, I will discover my own inner world, my own inner self, who I am, who I'm supposed to be. But doesn't that have your narrative have embedded within it the very Western idea that integral to love, at least of the erotic kind, is the falling in love moment. Uh, you know, in the, the in Hindu culture, it's not mm. like that. You, your parents uh, negotiate the deal, and you might be just discovering your lifelong sure. companion for the first time on the morning of your marriage. Yes. Um, and uh, but the, if the deal has been properly worked out, and everybody's been attentive to their duty, it works, it seems to last longer. I mean, man, many of us, uh, many people think it's precisely this emphasis on the, uh, you know, the, the uh, epiphany, the, 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 the sudden illumination, the sudden moment of, of, uh, of rejoicing in another and, right. and clinging to it, which makes our marriages so impermanent. Well, I don't I, know. I, I, I agree, but I mean, I, I mean my, my emphasis is not on uh, love at first sight. I don't even mm. think those words are used at all in either of my books, ever. Mm. My emphasis is much, mm. I mean, I keep using the word glimpse in the mm. sense that, you know, we glimpse, and the, and the word glimpse suggests that it's pretty provisional, um, right. and it's just a tentative thing, but my real emphasis is much more on a sort of the Aristotelian type of then engaging and living together and trying to live in this shared world together, and to develop mm. lives that are bound so, so up then and projects much, that are bound up. Yeah, it's much more and, like a, uh, um, a, but, a labor uh, um, that you engage in together. Uh, which, um, a work of love, so a to work, speak. Yeah, well, a, a devotion, yeah. a mutual devotion. But, it's, but whether or not that coming together is, is, is arranged or happens by serendipity is mm. secondary in my own account. Right. Anyway. Maybe this might be a good moment to ask if anyone would like to come in on any of the topics raised. Yes, I think you were first. Um, this question mainly addressed um, to Roger um, concerning the relationship between death and love, and mortality and love. Um, we might, not all of us can hope to be like Borges and Philemon and end our lives um, mm. at the same time. And I'm interested in how emotional mortality plays out in couples, right? Maybe because of reasons because of an age, or because one is living with perhaps a chronic disease or a terminal disease, um, one can reliably expect that uh, one's partner will outlive them, or mm. the other way around. Does that change the fundamental dynamics of life? Well, I, 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 it could do. Obviously, um, 
it's it's part of the deal uh, whatever the nature of the of the age, whatever the age of the partners it's part of the deal that that this is a, a, an arrangement between mortals and um, you're not going to be able to foretell exactly whether they will go through life always together that is but I don't know I mean uh, uh, I think I think when you're all you're aware of course of you have a, a vision of what life will be like without the other uh, and what life would be like for the other without you um, but that vision is like a sort of a, a misty landscape beyond the uh, the area in which you are conducting your life it doesn't it doesn't impact on it in the same, in any direct way and i think that's that's even so for people who are living so you know where one of the partners is has a, a really difficult disease or a mortal disease or something it it's put out of mind because it doesn't have a role to play in the love except in so far as creating some of the circumstances for the love I think um, but all the caring that were, that two people have for each other is predicated upon the fact that they're both vulnerable and it's perhaps the vulnerability more than the the, the uh, mortality that matters uh, yes well, I, I think actually just go, I want to go back to um, to what Douglas said about plays, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Um, I think it's now sort of open. Right. Uh, the, I, I totally agree with with Douglas's view that that Schiller is a really important thinker in this area, um, and um, his he emphasises play in a rather different way from the way in which it would be emphasised by a psychologist. I mean, for him it was a paradigm of, of um, an activity performed for its own sake. You know, that this, when you're, well, uh, he says um, in, uh, I can't remember, in, um, in business and, uh, and uh, pursuing of one's needs, man, man is merely in earnest. But with beauty, he plays. So that this was his way of saying that uh, that uh, play is the way we should understand the entire range of things that are, are meaningful in themselves, things which are which contain their meaning within them. Beauty, and that's that is the idea of beauty for him. And uh, and um, this is true of of love as well. So that. Uh, you know, what the modern s s sentimental emphasis on love as the meaning of everything is actually, although it, it, it's a bit nauseating in the way it's become a cliche introduced into every discussion, it is another way of going back to what Schiller was trying to say, that we only find meaning in life if we find those things which have value in the, for their own sake, intrinsically. Uh, in other words, when we, when we have moved out of instrumental reasoning into contemplating the world as it is mm -hmm. and love has that element in it you know there is no further reason why you love someone except that he or she is the person that he is and that that um so, so love becomes a paradigm of this if you like the rescue that we can all achieve from the world of instrumental thinking so, to, so as to be able to see the world as an end in itself, and ourselves as a, as justified within that, uh, and so I, I I think that's an aspect of love which is really important, and it, it is just to continue what I was thinking about the way in which love becomes this all cuddly cliche um, that that is a, an abuse of love that is putting love back into the instrumental picture. You know, the, the consumer society, the consumer version of love, um, the cuddles available out of, uh, from the supermarket shelf. Uh, uh, and love, as properly understood, is that thing that Schiller's trying to get at, which is um, another instance of beauty as such. And if I may pursue this Grutonian mm. thought a bit mm. further, 
That's the reason why the notion of love, um, not just in our Western tradition, but in other traditions as well, is, is often closely associated with the sacred. Yes. Yes. That's another... We, we haven't touched on that yet, but that's a really good topic. Um, obviously, going back to the Hindu marriage, what's absolutely vital in the Hindu marriage um, is not the that uh, that is the aspect of choice or anything like that. Is is that this is a sacrament? Um, you know that uh, and that's what makes it the the infinitely valuable thing that it is. Not the fact that that, that you know that a glance across a, a crowded room has met its match or anything like that. It is this uh, uh, performance in which the whole community is involved. Uh, and that's the making sacred, as you, you would obviously. That's your your topic, the making sacred of something by our own um, sacrificial behaviour, which in turn connects, I suppose, with with Simon's idea of the, the being called in a certain direction, yes. the self we are meant to be. Uh, and there may be a tension there between the spontaneity of play and the spontaneity mm. of some kinds of love, where people are finding the way for themselves in a, in a free and unconstrained way, um, between that and the idea of the vacation, the, the, the right direction which you might try and get out of, but ultimately you're called to go that way, and only there, in that pre-laid-down goal, will you mm. find completion. Yes. Well, that's a great. So we were talking about it earlier today, the, and the, um, the notion of a call, the, the Heideggerian notion of the call, which is um, also there in Levinas and so on, the summons to be yourself. Uh, and I think that, that connects also with the, with the whole tra falling in love tradition, that you're being called to, to, to be what you truly are by the other um, and the, the, the problem is that we're, we're all agreeing with each other we need an acerbic note to be injected yes. from the floor and, but whether acerbic or not does any, would, mm. would anyone like to I, I was just going to ask yeah. um, all of you how did we become educated in love How do we learn to love? <laughs> we clearly learn as children in the first instance, don't we, by, by receiving mm. love we didn't ask for. And we, we learn about it before we fully understand it. And uh, as we were discussing this morning, uh, Descartes, who's often thought of, René Descartes, who's often thought of as the champion of the perfectly transparent mind with its clear and distinct ideas, actually said about the passions, and he, sing, he included the passion of love, that they're often very hard for us to understand because they're joined, without us knowing it, to mm. both to physiological responses which have been laid down way back and with psychologically with experiences of early childhood, mm. uh, for example, of being parented, which are now only dimly, if at all, remembered. And yeah. There is a problematic aspect to love because of that, which of course Freud and others yeah. picked up on. Yes. I mean, this, learning to love is an interesting idea. Um, the I in erotic love, there has to be that large element of instinct, the immediacy of um, just wanting that other person in in, um, in physical way and uh, and um, the way of tenderness and so on, but um, that's not enough, uh, and everybody then has to learn how to love properly, say in a marriage, as the as the erotic fires die down, there is to, there is the day to day loving, which is the really hard part of it. Uh, and I think, you know, 
that that's true also it, 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 with other kinds of love. Obviously, Kierkegaard's writings about the works of love concern um, agape, not eros. Um, and he, his, his view is essentially that you only love properly the other if God is the middle term. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means there's a constant labour to bring God into uh, the relation. A constant looking up towards uh, the ways in which your relation with the other will embody an ideal of love. And that is work. Yes. Can I just add to what Roger said? Um, I think uh, learning to love is less about, although it can be about, I don't want to knock it, um, you know, the 10 steps to a good relationship, which all, all the things you hear about listening and so on, which is very important. But the, the one thing that seems to me is the real object of education in love or of learning is attentiveness. And attentiveness is, I mean, some people think, I, I think I'm right in saying Simon Weil thought that love just is attentiveness. So, I mean, when you are attentive to something, you love it. I don't take that view. I think that love is motivated by other things, but that attentiveness is the absolute key to love going beyond an attitude to a relationship. And I do think attentiveness can be learned, it can be trained, it's a virtue. And it's perhaps the, one of the hardest of all the virtues yeah. to train. And mm -hmm. it's needed to do anything properly in life, uh, not just to love. And the second point I'd make in connection with that is, you know, the mysterious thing, um, the commandment in the Bible to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you know, the old sort of question that was raised in that context, how on earth can love be commanded? I mean, it has to be in some sense voluntary and if it's not then it's not the real thing and it's i actually i mean my own answer to that uh, um, it's just a provisional answer i don't even know it's the right if it's the right thing is to say actually no love can't be commanded but what can be commanded is attentiveness mm. and that you can be commanded and that's the thing that being naturally lazy creatures we're likely to you know we're very happy to either be told to in the arranged marriage situation to be told, you know, this is your wife and husband, or to fall in love across the crowded room. But the hard work of attentiveness is something that laziness naturally sets aside. And I think yes. there, that can both be commanded and educated. Yeah. Yes, it I, must I be. very much agree with that. And uh, just to add a footnote to what Simon's been saying, it seems to me attentiveness is connected with, I don't know quite what the right word is, recognition. That's to say, recognizing the person mm -hmm. you love for as they are looking as iris Murdoch looking would yes say. not not yeah, for what really looking uh yes taking the time and this is immensely difficult uh, rather than projecting onto them what you think they ought to be mm. or projecting your needs onto them but but seeing them as an a, a different individual mm. who is different um from you and that difference is is, is essential to, uh, it seems to me, to, to the proper functioning of love. Um, if, uh, yeah. Yeah, Douglas. if you can forgive, forgive me for going off on a tangent as well, it seems to me there's also something particularly interesting in the phenomenon of intellectual love, I, that curiosity mm -hmm. that is part of our being, that the... Mm -hmm. The desire to know, as Aristotle puts it, the amor de intellectualis of Spinoza, the, or the, the nucerone of, of Plotinus. I mean, and, and in a way, it seems to me that part of the crisis of the modern university is the loss of this sense of um, yes. the love that is part of our curiousness about the world. I totally agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. And the and loss of play and thought. Exactly. It's, yes. it's mm. all become, you know, producing these papers and publishing. I mean, any decent writing, I always feel, is you are playing. You have to enjoy it. Yes. And, 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 and it's a form of play. And uh, I totally agree with you. Totally agree. Simon, you also make some suggestive remarks about paideia. And I wondered if I could just pick you up on those in your book. Um, and that's partly what I had in mind when I asked about being educated in love. There has to be a kind of almost master-pupil relationship to bring someone along. 
this kind of attentiveness that you're talking about. I, yes, I don't think I developed that in great detail, no, but I, no, but, no. but uh, I, I think I think it's covered by my point about the, you know, learning how to see, learning how to be attentive, but that's not unique to love. You know, that could be learning how to. I mean, the most important thing, for example, when you're playing a musical instrument, I mean, assuming that you can basically master it, is to listen to yourself, and unless you know, learn how to listen, it requires unbelievable concentration. I just say that as an amateur. I find that the far more difficult than getting across the keyboard, is remembering to listen. It just goes, you know, it can go within two minutes. You're just playing. And I think in love, you know, I think, well, like in everything, it's really no different to anything else. This is something that uh, ideally you should be taught, yes. I mean, I would institute that at a very young age, teaching people how to listen, teaching people how to attend. as part of everything they do. That's really all I meant there, I think. Right. Yeah. Mm. I just wondered whether that point connects to Douglas's uh, emphasis here on play, because if um, love involves a rescue from the world of instrumental thinking, making sacred of something, learning how to really attend to the value of, of a person or thing, then I had the impression that your thought was that play has a privileged place in that enterprise. It's in play that we learn to have this non-instrumental attitude towards persons or things. So in, in that case, play would have a particularly important role in cultivating the sort of valuing involved in them. Yes. I mean, carefully construed, obviously, I'd, I'd want to avoid some of the misleading associations of play, so I'm drawing quite consciously on this particular, exactly, this particular philosophical tradition. And Plato has a lot to say of, about ab play Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes. Um, also, I think it's interesting that it, in a way, play um, is prior to culture, and yet, paradoxically, the highest forms of culture are themselves forms of play. I think there, there is an interesting contrast here between working together and playing together. Uh, you know, uh, workmates have a task that they share, uh, and people who work together in a, uh, you know, on a building site for say three years become very close, but not in the way that people become immediately close when playing a game together. And the um, or chamber music, or, or chamber music, yes, or, and so on. Uh, and um, there is, this is a form. Both of these are forms of togetherness, which are not yet love. Um, and uh, you know, but you might, nevertheless, nurture your whole life on this. You know, there are people for whom, playing in the team every Saturday, that is their life, uh, and it's. Um, and it replaces love in a way, because it it is also fills their life with a sense that there is something which is an end in itself, even if it only comes around on a Saturday. James, I think you. Uh, yes, I think Connor is first, but I mean, since it ties to what's just been discussed, I, I mean, I think I agree with Simon that in the Jewish and Christian conceptions of the divine play it doesn't a great deal is the sort of canonical texts, but there's quite a strong strain that creation is an act, act gratuit, as it were. It's, it's wholly unconstrained, it's, it's not hard work for God. Um, he has to rest on the seventh day. I suppose yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that the adequate, the, the sort of a proper response, you see this in the Psalms a lot about you know, the, the, the valleys clapping their hands and sort of the adequate response creation is, is a similarly sort of unconstrained, uh, playful, uh, rejoicing. Um, and I suppose also there are many forms of play that do have a telos. Um, games have a, have, a, have a quite complex telos. Um, but anyway, just to... Yeah. And there's the notion of uh, Sophia, of wisdom, 
um, and the rather enigmatic reference in uh, Proverbs mm -hmm. to, to wisdom, it's often translated as playing uh, at the dawn of creation. Yes. Mm -hmm. That gets picked up in by the Russians, particularly Solovyov and others. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I thought as you were speaking, James, that, you know, the valleys shall stand so thick with corn that they shall laugh and sing. That, that, or yes, uh, <coughs> all the woods in the forest shall sing for joy. But in that line from the Psalms, immediately follows, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. Mm. So <laughs> <laughs> the heavy, the serious note comes back pretty yes, quick. Play while you can. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no, I think they're rejoicing at justice, oh, justice coming yes, down yes, like the right, like the yes. Yes. Mm. and so the you know the cells we are meant to be is, uh, in a serious way is never yes. far from the surface. Right. Sorry. No. Um, so you, just maybe to push back against the idea of um, play as a, a way of thinking about love. I mean, it's often said and quite correctly that uh, a successful romantic relationship involves so com continual compromise. Um, navigating different difficulties, uh, deferring of temporary pleasures, um, all sorts of hard work. Um, and that, at least superficially, seems like uh, a tension with the idea of love as involved in play, the idea that it can be an arduous, painful process to be involved in love. Um, so I wonder if anyone on the panel would like to comment on the resolution of this contradiction, uh, if it is purely a superficial one. I would say that, of course, that there's hard work involved, um, but it is for an end, and that end uh, is something more akin to play than to work. You know, you, you've got to work to get into the situation where you can renounce work and just sit and be, as John was saying, just be by the fireside. Um, so I suspect there's no real contradiction here. Um, it, it, but uh, obviously everything that is being treated as a means is hard work mm. and it's when you've got through to the other side that the, that the play aspect I mean not, we might want to not want to call it play but we might want to just to say it's the, the fruition of being or something like that I suspect the turn the conversation is taking may, may be a hint that uh, we ought to be thinking about drawing our <laughs> discussion to a close. We've been going for well over an hour, but we have got time for, particularly for anyone who, who yes. Sonia, there was some comments to be made about, I'm picking up on what you said in response to Jim's question, about God's labour as and, and resting, whether this idea that the seventh day of creation, the Judeo-Christian account, is precisely a, a renouncing of work and laying down the work and setting mm. the sign of work and that that may be just interested to know what to work mm. and that in the light of the conversation. The, the, the idea of the Sabbath, of course, is, is very important, is, is sacred time, time which is mm. set aside from the rest of the week. And um, God's loving work of creation allows for that sacred space that for, for human beings. Um, any parent who, who kept their child at it seven days a week would not be a loving parent, I think almost by definition. Actually, the, the Sabbath idea, I think, is fundamental to understanding love in the end. Uh, I, I've, it's like, oh, I have it. What I, what, yesterday I was I talked about the the smile, you know, um, smiling at someone is a way of being with that person, but but not in any way using them, or, or it's a, it's a sort of blessing conferred on the other, saying it is good that you are, and I think that's what to what people do when they're in a proper loving relation, that they are conferring on each other the blessing of the of a smile saying, you know, I, it, I am towards you in this way because it's good that you are. And uh, I think the Sabbath is a way of, of understanding the whole world like that. You know, for a brief moment, you, you lay aside the instrumental way of thinking and see the world as God sees it you know, and say it is good. And there's a collective smile. This is one of the great triumphs of the Jewish religion, I think, to have implanted that smile in the heart of ordinary life. 
and I think if I were to go on moralizing, I would say <laughs> it is one of the one of the worst things that's happened in my lifetime is the abolition of of, Sunday. The, of a Sunday, and the abolition of the day of rest and the, the the day that is set aside not to do things but to appreciate the the world. But um, that but I think love has a lot to do with that. You know that um, I was brought up. As that we all were, I'm sure, in a, a world in which Sunday was reserved for the family and for the loving relations in, in which you were embedded, and, and uh, you know, Sunday lunch was a very important episode in, in which you celebrated this. The fact that my father was so appalling that I only wanted to run away <laughs> is a minor dif difficulty in my life. But, um, on the other hand, the <laughs> number of novels, Victorian novels, can't cite chapter and verse, where S Sunday is a pretty grim, yes. <laughs> because they're not, not only, I mean, they can't go to work, but they're not allowed to play either. They have no, to I, uh, sit and read and improve. Well, of book. course, the, um, the whole uh, Massachusetts experience, mm -hmm. you know, where the Puritans released themselves at last from, from the, the old world where, where they where they had to play on Sunday. Now they could forbid it. I think it, this might be an opportunity for some disagreement because Simon is very clear that uh, love doesn't necessarily have anything to do with beauty. Whereas I think for Roger and Douglas, love and beauty are quite close. Uh, and even if on Sunday we're recognizing that it is good, I think that's another way of saying there's something beautiful about it all. All this work has made it right, made it fit. Um, so I wonder if this would be an opportunity for some disagreement on the panel. I think you're trying to, <laughs> to, to mm. manufacture mm. disagreement where there is probably not that much. Okay. I mean, certainly not about Sunday. And as far as love is concerned, yes, I mean, I think that love can be aroused where, there, where we do not perceive beauty in an object. But I think that the moment we love somebody, we will then see beauty. We will then impose beauty on them. And that's, you know, but I know that my distinguished panelists disagree with that. We're not going to rise to it. No, I think we should not. Another area, isn't it, entirely? Yes, it's area. Uh, we should not exactly. manufacture mm. discord. I think. Um, Except I, one could say, of course, well, I, I don't want to take this on too long, but, but of course, there's the complexity of the notion of of beauty yes. uh, and the complexity of, as Frisbee very eloquently mentioned in the, you know, the beauty of Socrates and the, 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 the paradox of that beauty that nevertheless bids, um, but, but it's a notion of beauty that is tied to a certain notion of a training of the soul. Um, so perhaps we, yeah. perhaps mm -hmm. our disagreements are less pronounced than I thought. <laughs> Good. Well, I sense we are, we are, we've reached a, a mm. calm. We, we're unable to get out of the calm waters, um, despite <laughs> James's valiant attempt to. to um, but it's been a very interesting discussion, and um, obviously, food for further thought. So I'd really like to thank um, um, James for organising the, the panel, and our three panelists: Douglas Headley, Simon May, and Roger Scruton. Um, for a most fruitful discussion, and, uh, and above all, thank you all in the audience for coming, and for and for your your questions and for keeping us at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.